Hey again, everyone. It's Rob Ryder. It's November 1st, 2012. And more on what we were talking about on yesterday's video. Uh, but first, my email address is quarterrecord at AOL.com. And the things that I'm talking about and the, uh, well, whatever kind of attachments there are should be found on robquarterrecord.wordpress.com after this audio. And the audios are on Rob Ryder, R-O-B-B-B, I had to use three B's, R-O-B-B-B-R-Y-D-E-R on YouTube. And we're talking about the court of equity and, you know, what chancery was and what equity is and what it is not, the difference between legal and equitable title, what it means for in rem compared to in personam, what the difference between a unilateral contract is where one person signed compared to a bilateral or two people have signed. That's pretty self-explanatory. Merger of law and equity, equitable remedy, maxes of equity. All good things to know. And the things that uh, I am downloading, in case you can't find them, I, I found on this site here, uh, most of them at least, Digital Commons at Michigan State University College of Law. And they got a website. And so these are just little pamphlets that have been uh, uh, published by the faculty. And they got some pretty interesting titles. And uh, we're going to be talking about those. So I can only really go through one, but these other ones I'm going to send because I had come across them and I can't wait to read them because <laughs> of what they say, so or appear to say. And again, I hate to do this, but if you can donate, I am, for right now, Robert Ritlewski, R-Y-T-L-A-W-S-K-I. Give me those Federal Reserve notes. i got to use that name. 10955, 14 Mile Road, Rockford, Michigan, 49341. And my daughter's PayPal account is ashleyritluski at gmail.com. And thanks for all those who have donated. Uh, much appreciated. So let's get on to why we're doing this. Um, so before I go to the one that we're going to be looking at, I might look at some of these other ones I found. Where, here, here's an, Read this thing. Equitable self-ownership for animals. You got to be kidding me! <laughs> That's what we are. <laughs> you know, we're we're freaking animals, man. And so here in the abstract, this is what the guy says: This article proposes a new use of existing property law concepts to change the jur juristic personhood status of animals. Presently, animals are classified as personal property, right? So we're, we've been classified as personal property which gives them no status or standing in the legal system for the protection or promotion of their interests. Go figure. Professor Favre suggests that it's possible and appropriate to divide li living property into its legal and equitable components. That's what they've done to us. And then transfer the equitable title of the animal from the legal title holder to the animal itself. All right? So we've been given equitable title. Somebody else holding the legal title. That would create a new limited form of self-ownership in an animal with equitable self-owned, <laughs> an equitably self-owned animal. <laughs> Such a new status would have two primary impacts. First, the animal would have access to the legal system, at least in what has historically been the realm of equity. This is exactly what we're talking about for the protection and assertion of his or her interest. Because they've done this split and we have equitable title, we have to go to equity. And this guy is going to do it talking about freaking animals. And I can't wait to read it because self-ownership, right? Understand and modifying principles of property law. Creation of new equitable property interest. Division of ownership into its legal and equitable aspects. Tr transforming title to legal personhood. These are the things that have happened to us, right? And, and this dude wrote about it. I, I I bless his heart. <laughs> I can't wait to read it. Um, and here's a couple other ones real quick. Uh, power and authority of tribal property. Now, if you were born on the continent of America, you're considered an Indian. So says uh, Webster's 1828. We're all Indians. So we have tribes. we got tribal property. What's our power and authority? Well, here's something that talks about Indian lands. And if you consider yourself... An Indian, because they do, you know, it ought to be interesting reading. And what was another one here? Uh, 
the comparative rights of indispensable sovereigns. Right? And this is what a law guy wrote, right? I mean, and this is like from, I don't know, the 2000s sometime. The compulsory joinder rule in Indian cases. The compulsory joinder rule in litigation involving sovereigns. Indian land claims, government operations of trust and trust relationships, gaming operations, that they got us involved in a gaming operation, right? So, that would be interesting reading. You know, but just the title itself, The Comparative Rights of Indispensable Sovereigns. I think it's worth a read from 2004. You know, the books we don't hear about. So, um, the one we're going to be reading is <coughs> Equitable Remedies and Principal Discretion, The Michigan Experience from 1977. Okay. Uh, the term equity is often misunderstood and as a consequence often misapplied by courts when asked to grant an equitable remedy. In a broad jurisprudential sense, equity means the power to do justice in a particular case by exercising discretion to mitigate the rigidity of strict legal rules. In other words, they hold the title, legal title, they're the owner. The judge has discretion to say, well, this guy has the equitable title. He says he's the owner. And between law and equity, equity wins. So it's good to be the equitable owner, as long as we know that we are. And now we can go get our legal title because we have the hot, we have the superior title by having equitable title. In this broad sense, equity means the power to adapt to relief of circumstances in particular cases, individualized justice, individualized justice in effect, judge-made law used for you. However, equity jurisprudence is not an open-ended system of boundless discretion vested in a single judge. As some professor said, one of the leading writers on equity once remarked in the context of court sitting in equity of a court sitting in equity. So we're looking for courts sitting in equity. Oh, it's excellent to have a giant strength, but it's tyrannous to use it like a giant. So this guy's saying the chancellor of the court of equity, whoever that is, has the giant's strength. In a more prosaic terms, equity is not a roving uh, is not a roving commission that empowers a judge to dispense his or her brand of justice in a particular case as he sees fit. The Michigan Supreme Court has made the point some 35 years ago. No court of chancery would con consciously attempt to correct the severity of the law, the law is very severe, or to supply its defects to any extent or under any circumstance beyond the already settled principles of equity jurisprudence. All right, so we have some already settled principles of equity, equity jurisprudence, and as long as it's within those realms, we can do this. They can't, they're not going to let this, whoever this chancellor is, run free because he could just shut down all the courts of law because they're all operating in fraud. But because we have separation of church and state, in law, they don't care if there's fraud, right? That only matters in equity, and that was with the bishop, that was with the diocese archbishops, whatever, and you know, whatever their representative have today, they still exist. And apparently they may exist in the courtrooms or in the court building, as, as we'll see. All right, so uh, any chance of the Michigan st should step beyond or over the settled principles of equity. All right, so we got settled principles of equity that we're going to deal with, and basically they're the maxims of law. All writers on the subject of equity, regardless of their philosophical persuasion, agree that the terms of equity and equitable are different, difficult to define. The loose use of the terms equity and equitable to mean fair, compassionate, flexible has resulted in decisions by equity courts whose rational rationale remains hidden when equity is offered as a reason for the decision. Okay? So, the, everything about the law says the case should go the other guy and all of a sudden you get the win. Right? How'd that happen? That's what they're talking about here. It remains hidden. How come that happened? There's no rational reason. It's because it's a conscious decision. 
for a court to say that it has decided to relieve a party from a contract because the bargain was too hard and the rest of the decision on the ground of equity says nothing about equitable principles, equitable precedents, or equitable remedies. A decision that rests solely on equity in an analytical, naked, and analytically suspect decision. It is a decision that rests on nothing more than the judge's subjective feelings of what is fair under the circumstances. Right? Who's a, who's um, who has clean hands? Who's operating in good faith? While one of the hallmarks of equity is its flexibility, its flexibility that is exercised against a backdrop of specific rules on fraud, misrepresentation, mistake, duress undue influence, unreasonable delay, and estoppel, right? These are all equitable remedies. Well, not remedies, but things we can use to get the remedy. Fraud, misrepresentation. Right? The, uh, the attorney on your foreclosure is says he represents the bank. Well, if he won't show you the contract, it's false representation. You can take that to the chancery. In Anglo-American law, equity means the system of distinctive concepts, doctrine, rules, remedies developed and applied by the courts of Chancellor in England and the American courts sitting in equity, right? Remember that, key. American courts sitting in equity. We're just trying to find the courts sitting in equity. Ask the frickin' clerk. Where are the courts sitting in equity? In short, equity and equitable refer to the whole body of equitable precedent and practice which lawyers and judges can only understand once they know such precedent and practice. Thus, for example, when an equity court grants an equitable remedy, the term has a precise meaning. It refers to a remedy such as an injunction, an order reforming a contract, an order rescinding a contract, or an order requiring specific performance of a contract. Those are the remedies of they're, they're not in here about money. The, the, this is all about rights, title, and interest. Right? And since no money exists anyways, we just want our personal property back, and they happen to be called negotiable instruments. But it isn't money. I don't want a money. I, I don't want a money uh, settlement. I want my property. Or its value. To gain a better appreciation of modern equity, helpful start, review the origins of equity. Yeah, so just... Real quick, I gave it careful the time here. Uh, two systems, of course, once existed in Anglo-American law. I had two different court systems. One court of law presided over by judges. Okay, the other court was an equity court presided over by the chancellor. He wasn't the judges. Two separate courts. They weren't mixed together. The chancellor, who was the high minister of the king and often a bishop of the church invented a body of substantive rules and remedies which in effect but not in theory so not so in theory they shouldn't work but in fact they do could trump the decisions of law courts in attempting to define equity most commentators provide a historical answer which is in the effect no answer that equity is a system of jurisprudence originally administered by the High Court of Chancery in England and now administered in courts of this country have an equity jurisdiction. Okay, so I looked online and our circuit courts say they have equity jurisdiction. And we'll talk more about them in a minute. Even today with the merger of the two court systems into a single court of general jurisdiction in Michigan, so a court of general jurisdiction is going to have jurisdiction and equity. And in federal and most other state courts, lawyers and judges still speak of legal remedies, meaning those traditionally administered by law courts, whoever has a legal title, and equitable remedies, meaning those remedies available in an equity court to the one who has the equitable title, and equity trumps legal. In that light, equity is a system of jurisprudence that originated and developed outside the common law courts to furnish plaintiffs a remedy not available in the courts of common law. The law courts of England derived their power directly from the king. In order to bring a complaint before the law courts, a plaintiff could purchase a writ from the chancellor today's equivalent. And so now they're saying he's the equivalent of a prime minister. Okay? Looking for clues who the chancellor is. Who's a prime minister? At a county level, who would you say is a prime minister at a county level? Who is it at a state level? Who is it at the federal level? 
which was then presented to law courts. The law courts, in turn, had the responsibility of hearing the case and granting the appropriate relief. Where a few fact situations were over, the chancellor provided a new writ. The issuance of a new writ tended to expand the national power and expense at the expense of local power. The lords objected to this development. Yeah, the people who owned the land didn't want people to have equity. They wanted to keep you a slave. Henry VIII was going to help them out. He took all the church land from the church and sold it to his friends. And all that church land had the hospitals and people who didn't own land it had their, where they had their farms and stuff. And Henry took it and sold it to his landlord friends, making serfs of everyone. Spiritual leader of the nation of England. Over time, the system of dispensing justice in law courts ossified. This hardening was attributed in large part to 1258, prohibition issued to the Chancellor and the provisions of Oxford, directing the Chancellor not to issue new writs. So this would have been a Catholic bishop who was given all the people <laughs> remedy, and the landlords finally bitched about it, without consent of the king and his council. Now it has to go to the king and the council. So, as England moved, because what this is, going to the chancellor are the common people to get a frickin' relief against the rich and powerful. And as we pointed out the one yesterday, not only did they get relief, but people were going to jail. That's how I read it. The rich and powerful. Because they could buy the court, but they couldn't buy the equity. The upshot was that as new situations rose, it became common to petition the king through his chancellor for relief, invoking the king's arbitrary power to do good and dispense justice. Beautiful. The chancellor was a powerful man whose decisions were as much political as judicial. The chancellor eventually developed some specific rule for specific situations, but many persons criticize equity as lawless thing where only the chancellor's discretion mattered, for which there was no law by which measures a person's rights to measure a person's rights or entitlements. As a bishop of the church, the chancellor often relied on appeals to conscience, which of course offered little guidance to petitioners. Well, why would it be a problem unless the guy bringing the charge is fucking lying? It's the only time he's got to worry about the bishop, right? As if you're telling him a lie. <laughs> we can't rape and pillage if the chancellor's doing his job. So why we got to go to equity? Equity in its early days was indeed a roguish thing. The chancellor gradually became a judicial officer in his department of the chancery. The court for dispensing remedies not available in the law courts. So we're looking for remedies not available in the law courts. The remedies available in the courts of common law had narrowed. Relief was inevitable, inevitably retrospective and in form of damages, right? It was money damages. No prospective relief of any kind was available. For example, reformation of contracts for mutual mistake was not available. So even if you both made a mistake in law, if you both made a mistake, you just want to change the contract, there's no remedy for that. The contract was either enforced as written or was completely invalidated. That was your choice, right? If you both made a mistake, it's either invalidated or you're going to live with it the way it is. Okay. As the number of appeals to the king grew, so did the Court of Chancery. The Court of Chancery rose to meet the exigencies of the day by providing preventive injunctive relief and specific relief. That this court was attempting to do equity, that is, to accomplish justice, gave rise to the term equity as a designation for the system of jurisprudence evolved. And the court that dispensed it as a court of equity. In court systems such as Michigan's that have merged legal and equitable procedures into one form of civil action, so there's an important word, it's one form of civil action in a single court, there's one court to take it to with both legal and equitable powers. The term a court of equity means the merged court exercising its 
equity powers. See, I think this court actually sits in the background. This is the one they keep walking back to when they leave the courtroom. I don't think it's the guy in the in the robe, man. This is, you know, this is the the clerk of the court of record as the register of chancery, and you take her this petition because it, it's something that would be going to the circuit court, <coughs> and she reads it. She's going to take it to the back room because you're going for equity. You're not going for law. Law is out there in the courtroom. Equity's in the back. It's where the chancellor is, and he's in the exchequer's office, right? He's watching over the treasury. <laughs> in fact, I think he's what they call here in Michigan. Now, on the on the Michigan level, he he may be a guy called the general auditor, because the auditor is really over the treasurer. Yet to be seen. the The point is. When we do our action, we take it to the clerk of the circuit court or the clerk of the court of record, whatever they would call it, um, at least here in Michigan, because I believe she's also the registrar in chancery. Over time, law courts were perceived as being writ bound. The effect was that less rigid equity courts became increasingly popular with litigants. Right? Less rigid equity courts. Good. A rivalry soon developed between law courts and chancery, reaching the point of the two court systems often issued contradictory rulings. And yeah, we talked about this before. No big deal. During the period of its greatest development, chance reviewed the chief function of equity as a vehicle for mitigating the harshness and smoothing out the rough edges of common law in the cases where the chancellor believed that some mitigation was required by conscience. Or natural law. Pff, yeah, stop with the fraud. For equities are from equity's earliest days, one can find biting criticism about the flexibility of equity. Probably the most famous of these is John Somebody, Sheldon. Uh, indictment that the Chancellor's conscience varied with the length of his foot. Okay. So um there you go, right? That's just history stuff. You can read it all you want. Let's get to some of this other stuff that's in here. In fact, I had a cheat sheet made up. Where did I put that thing? Okay. Equitable rem remedies, right? Equity courts insist on citation of legal authorities. That's on page 6. Where are we at? Okay. Uh, the single most important char characteristic of equitable relief to emerge as the system of equity developed was, and to this day still is, that such relief is deemed extraordinary, not ordinary. The first culinary of this axiom is that equitable relief was and is considered the matter of judicial discretion, not a matter of right. Thus, a party who sought equitable relief could not demand it as a matter of right simply upon a showing of specific facts that would fit the case into one of for equitable relief. This is what commentators mean when they say that granting or denying equitable relief is within the discretion of the court. They do not mean that the court has the power to grant equitable relief in every type of case presented as the spirit moves the judge. Rather, what they mean is the parties who have placed their case within the category of cases traditionally qualifying for equitable relief were not automatically entitled to it. Parties could not demand equitable relief. To the contrary, they always request it. So we're going to request equitable relief. Let's just write it nice. The parties who successfully made a case for equitable relief showed that theirs was the type of case where equitable relief had been granted in the past, still had to invoke the discretion of the court to grant the relief. So we have to invoke the discretion. What they're, they're saying up here about show, their, show that theirs was the type of case where equitable relief had been granted in the past, that's just the maxims of law. Right, so th those are what they're going to use as their precedents or procedures in equity. In a democratic society, this brand of seemingly unfettered discretion vested in a single person does not sit well. 
Can it be the case that a single judicial officer has the power to grant or withhold equitable relief as the Spirit moves him? The short answer is, of course not. A resounding no. <coughs> the short answer is, of course, comma, a resounding no. Which one is it? A more complete explanation requires an e examination of the term discretion means in its context and e equity. What does discretion mean? Oh, before turning it into discretion, yeah, okay, you know, what does it mean? I don't know. Oh, here's, uh, okay, what is this here? Beyond fundamental common law principles of deciding like cases in like manner based on precedent, there is also a serious due process consideration that an equity court must factor into its decision-making process, right? It must give you due process of law. That's what you get in equity. The first principle of due process of law, which contains standards that can be known in advance, conformed to, and applied rationally. Excellent. The doctrine of supremacy of law, a doctrine that the sovereign and all its agencies are bound to act upon principles, not according to arbitrary will, has a, a, are obliged to follow reason instead of being free to follow caprice. So all we need to do is show them there is a precedence for what we're asking. The chance of the di discretion to deny relief in a peculiar tradition to encounter <coughs> in a democratic society where the citizens possess rights under law, not really the hope of individual indiv indulgence or indulgences. Few American citizens, however, would think of themselves in court as humble petitioners on their knees before the judge who may deny relief on grounds that cannot be stated as principles or applied even handily to all suitors. So the only he can the only thing he can he can deny you relief for is you cannot state it to a principle. Why shouldn't a judge reach a decision that he sincerely believes is fair, moral, and just? Why, in all cases involving the exercise of equitable power, shouldn't a judge reach a decision that he sincerely believes is fair, moral, and just? Yeah, why not? In other words, equitable. In other words, it's saying that it may not happen under the circumstances. A system of justice that permits an equity court to dispense justice as it sees fit is, in a given case, without the constraints of legal rules, and principles allows courts to decide cases as their biases and attitudes dictate, without analysis and without law. Well, if everybody just followed their conscience, let their conscience be their guide, follow the Ten Commandments, we wouldn't have these problems. It's just there's a lot of people, you know, that were baptized, think they can be forgiven on Sunday, so they pray all day Sunday, and they pray on you the rest of the week. Take your ass into court, try to take your stuff. But they're sinners, man. We need to take them in. That's called bad faith. Do not generally act in bad faith. Yeah, right. While it's true that judges do not generally act in bad faith, judges are not free to act without stated reasons. Without reliance on guidelines, meaningful rules, judges who instead reach decisions based merely on intuitive feel, the right thing to do in the case will leave the lawyers at a loss about the proper evidence to introduce legal arguments to make. Yeah, there won't be any work for the attorneys. What are the established principles and maxims of equity? Equity developed a number of substantive maxims. And so the nice thing about these is as they go through them, they show a court case that it's been uh, talked about in. Okay. <clears throat> First principle, due process embraces, okay, which contains, yep, to deny relief is a peculiar tradition. It doesn't sound like it happens very often. The discretion of an equity court to grant or refuse equitable relief is regulated by well-known settled, settled principles and maxims. Right, so their discretion comes from the maxims. A court of equity will not always relieve 
apart from the legal consequences of a risk which he voluntarily assumes. Right? So if you voluntarily go in, I uh, will not relieve. Must be a party from legal consequences of a risk which he voluntarily assumes. So, you know, we're going to tell him we don't volunteer. The following are nine equitable maxims evoked by invoked in Michigan case law. Okay, so all these were invoked in Michigan case law. And so there's where the precedents come from to use in any case. Uh, page 13, citation 36 for misrepresentations. Right, so these were just highlights. I'm going to send this out with this thing. I'm getting tired of reading it anyways, and you know, you're going to have to read it. But I'm going to point at some highlights, make it worth your time reading. Equity cannot be used to deprive a person of a legal right. While equity is in a proper case, may reform a contract on the ground of a mutual mistake or rescind a contract for fraud in the inducement or duress. That's what equity can do. It can rescind a contract for fraud. The nine equitable maxims represented in shorthand from uh, represent in shorthand from the principles by which equitable re relief is granted or denied. Right. So we need to stick to the maxims. They're the principles. Page 20, equitable remedies, coercive and restitutionary. The classic mandatory injunction is, of course, an order requiring the seller of land to specifically perform the contract by conveying the land as promised. Okay, here's where we are. You bought some property from somebody. The other guy was the grantor. You're the grantee, right? For the longest time, all that ever happened was the grantor signed the warranty deed. We never signed it. Then we came later. Now we've acknowledged it. Well, what we've done, that deed um, has now been executed. Well, we're still waiting for them to send us the title, right? They haven't performed the contract. And so... The classic mandatory injunction is, of course, an order requiring the seller of land to specifically perform the contract by conveying the land as promised. They haven't done it yet. Up until you've acknowledged the deed of trust, or excuse me, the warranty deed, now this is the one for the real property, not the one for the personal property with the bank, the one that you did with the guy you bought the property from. All right? That has never been lawfully executed. Now, we've acknowledged it. He already has our money. So, where's the title? That's what we're going to find out. And you, and you take this. This is what you take to a court of equity. Right? I've acknowledged the deed. And I'll show you how it says to do this to determine the title for Property Michigan shortly. Uh, restitutionary, unjust enrichment. Restore something to the plaintiff that belongs to him. Let me do it now. Where's that? Okay, if you were to download uh, Michigan Court Rules of 1985, Google it, chapter, subchapter 3, easy enough to find, um, special proceedings and actions, because we're doing a civil action. And you can see right away it starts out with the Indians, and I'm telling you, we're all Indians, and all this has something to do with this. I have time for Indians right now. We'll have to get back to them shortly. Although, a reservation means Indian country, as defined in the Section 18, or, you know, Title 18, and, and any lands not covered under such section. So basically all lands for which title is either held by the United States in trust for the benefit of an Indian tribe or individual, right, or held in any Indian tribe or individual subject to a restriction by the United States against alienation. Subject to a restriction by the United States against alienation, right? So, unfortunately, right now it's held in trust, and we want to get it out of held in trust and put it in our hands. But, you know, that, that's what your house is. It's a reservation. Um, garnishment after judgment. Uh, hang on. Somewhere in here. No. Dang it. 
land. Okay, foreclosure of mortgages and land contracts, right? This tells you um, a plaintiff seeking foreclosure or satisfaction of a mortgage on real estate or land contract must state in the complaint whether an action has been brought to recover all or part of the debt secured by the mortgage or land contract and whether part of the debt has been collected or paid. Basically, this is used for foreclosures and satisfactions, right? So this is how you get your satisfaction. This is how you put a complaint into equity to get a satisfaction of mortgage. Here's the other one. Civil action to determine interest in land. This rule applies to actions to determine interest in land under some other things, to recover possession to premises under some other things, the complaint must describe the land in question with reasonable certainty by stating the section, township, and range of the premise, the number of the book and lot of, of the premise, or another description of the premise sufficiently clear so that the premise can be identified. And it must allege the interest of the plaintiff claims in the premise. You claim equitable title. The interest of the defendant claims. He claims legal title. The facts establish his premise. The, superior, the superior, superiority of the plaintiff's claim. The evidence we have and the maxims of equity. So that's how we're going to do it. Specific performance or an injunction is an alternative equitable remedy to an award of, for money damages, right? We don't need to take money. We can get specific performance. I don't want money. I wanted to freaking finish up the contract and give me the title. Rescissions, cancellation, and reformation of contracts and our other alternative and mutually exclusive equitable rem remedies. This is where you take contract stuff to, obviously. Rescissions, the term generally used to void contract that is executory, right? So now we're talking about the deed of trust, the one for the money. Deed of trust, mortgage, whatever they call it, where you and the lender and uh, title company or something got involved. You're the only one that signed it. It's a deed. They call them deeds of trust. A deed, a deed, a deed. Until the trustee, who is the, uh, uh, the one you're putting in trust to the property, or the lender, whoever it is, signs the damn thing, well, it hasn't been executed. So, you can get a rescission, the term generally used to void a contract that is ex executory. If they're not going to do it, then give me back my property. Cancellation describes a remedy for rescinding wholly executed, so this is one that's been executed, or voiding legal instruments such as deeds. So we need to get a cancellation on people's stuff that went to jail, because everything's a deed. More about that later. Reformation may be granted and contract contains mutual mistake or fraud. Right? Reformation may be granted if a contract contains mutual mistake or fraud. The legal remedy may be in inadequate and specific performance justified if the contract involves sale of something unique, such as land. Right? They will give you specific performance and make them finish the contract. Duress is the use of improper threats or economic pressure to secure a contract to someone other actions. That's what a policeman does to you. Duress is largely defensive and is typically used to defeat a claim for specific performance. However, it may also be used offensively to rescind an agreement and seek restitution. Right? So this is a defense you can use. You can use duress, but you need to use it in a court of equity. Undue influence differs from duress in that duress involves overt coercion by threats, whereas undue influence involves covert persuasion by, uh, by I think it's supposed to be by manipulation. The issue of mental incapacity is often present in undue influence cases. 
as it is in cases of misrepresentation. Right? The cop's not a public officer, right? That's misrepresentation. Thus, the most important evidence in undue influence cases is the existence of conditional uh, confidential relationship in which the submissive party reposes trust in the dominant party. Who's in charge of the trust? I guess. If undue influence, uh, in undue influence cases, context of confidential or fiduciary relationships, the fiduciary or dominant party, I'm going to say it's the state, I put that in there, has an affirmative duty not only to disclose information but also to avoid the use of information that rightfully belongs to the beneficiary, which is you, right? They have you in a database. You know, they're not supposed to do that. You can take that to equity. Right? You're, supposed, you're, you're supposed to have private information and if your privacy has been uh, disturbed, you take it to equity. If somebody stole your identity, you take it to equity. When should a court order rescission or cancellation of a contract, common ground for rescinding an agreement in the case of executory contracts or canceling an agreement in case of executed contracts? When may fraud or misrepresentation be invoked as a ground for rescinding a contract based on fraud or misrepresentation, right? The attorney does not represent the bank in a foreclosure, right? So since he doesn't represent the bank, because the bank's not going to say he's, the, their, he's their attorney, right? So when, when we take this to equity with, you know, got to pick up the right maxims to use, working on that next. But think about it, right? You're going to write the same kind of paper. You're going to write it as a petition. You're going to take it to the clerk of the court, but it's going to be written for equity, not for law. Uh, okay, a material rep misrepresentation, which is false, made with actual knowledge of its falsity or in reckless disregard of the truth, with the intention that the plaintiff will rely thereon and upon which the plaintiff acts to his detriment. Dude's going to jail. An injunction is the strong arm of equity. An injunction is an extraordinary remedy. The issuance of which rests with sound discretion of the court. Right? That study close, man. We we're gonna figure out a way to use this, get people out of jail. On the law side, the restitutionary remedies include ejectment, replevin, and pecuniary actions based on quasi contracts. So the law is going to is going to find for somebody with a quasi contract. What is that? It means it's not a freaking real contract because only one person signed it, and that's you. And they can eject you, replevin, and pecuniary actions, right? But the courts, but the law courts, require that a plaintiff seeking restitution in property cases have the legal title. As a consequence, the ejectment or replevin claim was of no help to a plaintiff with good title at law to the property in question. Right? Because good title at law doesn't mean anything if it was gotten by fraud. They're all good titles. In law, if you hold the title, you're the owner. Equity filled the remedial gap through the legal fiction that it did not decide title but acted on the person of the defendant. Right? So we're not going to question his title. We're going to question how we got the title. The four major restitutionary remedies in equity are the constructive trust, the equitable lien, and subordination, and accounting for the profits. This is excellent stuff. The defendant, that would be the bank attorney title company, one of them people, has legal title of property that you rightfully belongs to the plaintiff you, over which the court imposes a constructive trust, makes the defendant a constructive trustee, and orders the defendant to transfer title to the plaintiff as the true owner. They're going to put the plaintiff or, or the defendant and make him the constructive trustee. The equitable lien usually uh, uses similar concepts to give the plaintiff a security interest in all or a portion of the property held by the defendant. Right, the attorney, the attorneys claims the title to the deed of trust. Right. Well, somehow we're going to get a security interest in that. This is when they're going to tap his bond. 
In subrogation cases, the plaintiff, you, seeks restitution by standing in the shoes of a, and pursuing the rights of another. This is how you can help get somebody else out of jail. We're going to try to do subrogation. The accounting of profits takes the constructive trust remedy and applies it to the property that produces profits or income. Right? So they're going to make them account for the profits. Oh, this is powerful stuff. Discretion of the chancellor originated in a society where authority counted more than democracy and the wishes of the powerful for more than explanations. When a judge invokes discretion as the base of his ruling, he is in fact is tossing a wild card on the table and uses it to mean whatever he needs it to mean. They're not going to spend a lot of time explaining why it happened, but if we take it to equity, to the chancellor, who I think we get to through the clerk of the court of record, the circuit court clerk, county clerk in Michigan, telling them that this, is, that this is for the register of chancery to go to the court of equity, written as a petition for equity, we're going to find out what happens. Okay, I'm going to leave it at that. You all have a great night. I uh, hope you find it helpful.